Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit in June 2021. Uh, this is going to be a really uh, sort of powerful session where you know James is going to walk you through a lot of his thinkings on how to do threat modeling. James has done quite a lot of sessions here before. There's some really great materials already on YouTube, and now he's going to walk you through you know what is fundamentally a really important practice. And I've you know, for one, I'm trying to push all my teams to do threat modeling throughout the whole development life cycle. So it's it's really a massive, important topic. So James, over to you. Okay, uh, I'll skip normal introductions because uh, you don't really need to know and it's all on the internet anyway, but a few important things. If you want to interrupt to ask something, just interrupt, ask it straight away. I will completely forget what I was talking about if you save questions to the end and I'm fine with interruptions. <clears throat> and this is a at least semi-interactive workshop, so please help me out when we get to the exercises because otherwise I stand here looking like a lemon for quite a while, which is always embarrassing. Now with that said, introduction to threat modeling. This is all about not getting you to an expert level in threat modeling, it's just introducing the concepts, it's getting you to the point where hopefully you are comfortable to say, yeah, I think I could go and do that. I could read one of the methods and I could go and deliver threat modeling. There's also that for this presentation, there are certain things I am going to ask you to accept as absolute sacred truth. You can disagree with them, but if you do so, please do it silently inside your head or argue with me about it at the end, because I'm absolutely fine with being challenged on them. But for the presentation to work and make sense, there's certain definitions, certain axioms that you need to accept. So let's <clears throat> get that working, hopefully. Or not. Right. Introduction to threat modeling. So prerequisites absolutely none uh, if you know about threat modeling if you don't absolutely irrelevant doesn't matter in the least you will know about it after this and some definitions these are the things i'm going to ask you to just accept as truth for now so a threat it is something outside of our control Ultimately, we cannot control a threat, and that's vitally important. A vulnerability, however, is a weakness in our system. Whether that system is a technical system, whether it's IT, whether it's mechanical, whether it's some sort of policy or legal framework, it is some sort of weakness in our system. An impact is the thing that happens if a threat exploits a vulnerability. And a risk is what happens when we have a threat which would like to act on a vulnerability to cause an impact. So a risk does not appear if you don't have a threat or if you don't have a vulnerability or if you don't have an impact. You have to have all three. A couple more definitions. At safety, we are protecting against something passive, something inherent, something that just exists. So environmental threats. Now, yes, they might adapt and change, but they're not doing so in any malicious manner. They, are, they don't have agency. A security threat means that there is something active, something with agency behind it. Now, usually this will mean humans. There is an argument it could include aliens or it could include true AI, but we're going to leave those out for now and just say humans and accept that aliens don't exist and there is no true AI. And this workshop focuses on threat modeling for security. So you can do threat modeling for safety, it's much the same, but this is about security. The way I like to kick off these is to go through the different approaches that you'll come across to threat modeling. <clears throat> and ultimately, I found these can be boiled down in one of three ways. You have the approaches that focus on the threat. They put the threat front and center and say, we are going to threat model from the threat. You've got the ones that focus on the impact or sometimes the asset. 
These are the ones that focus on the consequence, the thing that will happen if it's not prevented. Focus on the vulnerabilities. They focus on the weak. risk-led or holistic threat modeling. That's basically what's happening. You've got someone combining these three methods in different ways so that they're ending up with risks at the end. They are not trying to do all three at once. There will be stages in a process. <clears throat> and probably the most important point to my mind about threat modeling is that you can't address everything. You cannot do a fully comprehensive threat model. It cannot be done. You can't even list out every possible threat. So threat modeling is all about focusing and targeting where you want to apply your effort to reduce your risk. So using a basic, very high level method with the right focus, using just the type of stuff you're going to be seeing today and learning today and nothing else, but with effort put into the focusing, will do much, much more for you than trying to build a perfect threat model. So where does threat modeling go wrong? Because it does a lot. Uh, people deploy it badly, they use it badly. Well, there's making the bed. And this is where people are trying to threat model a system that's already been built and finished. There are, There is a purpose in doing that. It can be useful, it's not useless, but it is not the aim of threat modeling. Threat modeling is security by design. You have to be doing it at the design phase. You can't do it after the design phase and think that you've managed to master it. If you're doing it later than design, you're either continuing on the threat model, which is fine, or you are doing it too late. So don't do threat modeling after you've made the bed. Start it at the moment that you've, before you start making the bed, while you're still wandering around IKEA. Uh, boiling the ocean. This is where people say, I want to threat model my whole organization. I want to do a comprehensive threat model of everything in my organization. And what that means is I want to go off for four years and not really do any proper work and then come back and say, I came up with a threat model and have someone turn around and say, yeah, but one month after you started it, it was already out of date. <clears throat> so boiling the ocean doesn't work. You have to focus, you have to be targeted, you have to keep it narrow and manageable. And counting grains of sand. And this usually happens more with the vulnerability focused threat models. So this is more on the ones where it's all focused on the vulnerability. And you end up just saying, okay, well, we'll threat model by looking at the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, and we will run through everything and see whether that could apply to our system. And again, you can't do that. It has to be focused, it has to be fast, because if you're going to do threat modeling properly, you have to do it at the speed of development or as close to it as possible. You cannot slow down development because then your threat model gets left behind. So doing it right, very easy. You do the right work, you do it at the right time, and you do it with the right tool. There are dozens of threat modeling methodologies out there, and there's even more where people build their own. Pick which one works. That is the most important thing. It's not which one is perfect. It's not which one has the most academic work put into it. It is the one that works for your security team, your development team, your project management team, your architects. It is the one that fits with your organization. And if you have to chop bits off to make it fit, then do that. You can always start sticking them on later when people are comfortable with it. Now, at the right time is at the beginning. At the moment someone has scrawled an idea for a project, a couple of sentences on the back of a napkin, you should be starting to threat model. You can take that idea, you can build an initial threat model around it, and you can then carry that through and develop it more and more as you go. 
once you've got architectural diagrams, once you've got technology selections done, it is too late. You have wasted a lot of time. And the right work is just doing it. It is moving forwards. <clears throat> Any questions before we kick into actually doing some of the threat modeling and looking at some of the different approaches out there? I will take the silence as you're all being stunned into absolute silence. So threat focused approach right at the start. What or realistically, this is security modeling, who threatens my goals? Who is trying to stop me from achieving whatever my goals are with this system? It's the highest level approach to threat modeling. <clears throat> it's not that helpful for risk management in and of itself but it is extremely helpful for focus and it is the one you can do earliest. And if you're going to do threat focus, threat modeling, make it personal. And the reason for that is frankly, really cheaty psychology. We relate to people, we understand people. We do not understand abstract threats. If I tell you the threat is ransomware, that doesn't tell you much. If I tell you it is George, the programmer from, I don't know, across the road who's built his own ransomware service and is using it to try and attack, that's a completely different thing. It's still the same threat in many ways, but because you understand the motivations of George intrinsically by being human, it makes it much easier to relate. It makes it much faster to build up the threat model. So making the threat human and personal is really, really useful. Now, there's a couple of methods to do this. There's one called persona non grata. Uh, these are adversary cards. There's various others out there. People sometimes just stick up a picture of someone or write their name on a board, anything, <clears throat> but make it personal. Uh, these are the adversary cards, and this one should be familiar to everyone, or at least you'll have heard of it. It's the public Gitter. It is that developer who never learned to use the private repositories. And so they just push everything up to the public repository and leave it there, and they include their API secrets, and they include hard-coded passwords, and they include internal infrastructure documentation, all sorts of things. And this is an important bit about threats. They aren't necessarily malicious. They're not necessarily evil. They're not necessarily out to get you. They can just be negligent. They can just be lazy. They can just be ignorant. So threats are not necessarily malicious. Having said that, some are. So this is Melissa Fisher. And Melissa Fisher, as you can see, social engineer, classic social engineer, uses social media, uses LinkedIn, email, impersonation, any tactic they can to try and draw out information which can then be used to attack the company in some way. Also, one of the most common and damaging that you'll come across. Uh, we've got the evil DevOps. Now, this is George, who for some reason has green skin. Uh, George from across the way, who has built a ransomware as a service platform <clears throat> and they keep it up to date they keep it managed they notice when certain security companies publish a decryption tool and within days they update their platform so that it's no longer vulnerable to that particular exploit they're in it for the profit again it's a personal one and we also have vance heck so a Bit of history for anyone who doesn't know, this is named after Vanek Freaking, which is a form of security exploit, arguably, which eavesdrops on, or originally eavesdropped on CRT monitors by picking up the radiation and recreating the image. Really clever attack, really clever use of physics, different ways it could arguably be used now, but, I've included this one for a specific reason, which is unless you are in one of a very, very small number of targets, 
And if anyone here is in one of them, then you probably can't tell me anyway. Unless you're in that small number of targets, this is not a threat. The resources, the effort, it's just not worth their while unless there is something of great value that they can gain. <clears throat> so there have been examples of this being used, uh, of hotel rooms being rented out in order to spy on diplomats, ambassadors, other people, downstairs, upstairs, next door. But for the vast majority of cases, it's just not a threat. It's not realistic. This is a sophisticated, targeted threat. And if something like this comes into your threat model <clears throat> and you are not in one of the particular areas where it definitely applies, throw it out because you will waste a lot of effort and a lot of energy talking about this really exciting, sexy threat and ignoring the ones that really matter. And it's not one you have the resources to fix anyway. Right, so I just need to move some screens around quickly. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So into designing threats and here you're actually going to be designing it so if if you can't hear me if you haven't been able to hear me now is the time to let me know if you can hear me now is also the time to let me know i think we can all hear you okay Hopefully. good <laughs> good that's promising at least right <clears throat> designing threats these are the threats these are the personal aggressive nasty attacky threats we're going to be dealing with and we're going to use persona non grata very cut down version of it we're going to be looking at a house where food is stored and people live and there's electronics around standard house because you're all familiar with that <clears throat> now don't spend too long modeling threats at this sort of level. Mostly your first instinct will be right enough to move on and give you a useful start. So a quick list of motivations and tactics is absolutely fine to start with. So that's what we'll be doing. Uh, this is Trixie Dixon. So I'm going to give you a couple of motivations for Trixie. Very food oriented. There we go. So with those motivations, I'm now going to ask you to suggest some tactics that this attacker might use. Given the system we're talking about, which is a house where cat food is stored and people live and other cats live, what sort of tactics might Trixie use to achieve her aims? Just drop it in the chat, speak out however you want to do it. Please don't leave me standing here in silence, awkwardly staring at the screen. Messing up the kitchen to find food. So, <clears throat> absolutely. And uh, in fact, we had someone cat sitting them a while ago uh, who didn't close the kitchen properly. So, a whole cardboard tube of treats got eaten including most of the cardboard uh, evil cat thoughts yep general mischief yelling when people are on zoom calls that's enough you know that's a couple of tactics they are things we can defend against we might say, well, you know, when we're building this house, when we're designing this house, we want a kitchen door that actually latches shut properly and auto closes. <clears throat> we want to prevent that. Uh, evil cat thoughts, nothing we can do about that one. We're just going to have to accept it. 
So we then have <coughs> cat number two. Now, cat number two, slightly different motivations. Don't, don't ask me why, you know, we're not talking about brightest of creatures here, but <coughs> she loves to play. Uh, she loves to chase socks. She likes to fetch socks. She likes to trip people over. Tactics to achieve her goals. Yep. Yep, scratching the couch, denial of furniture attacks. If you're too shy to put it in the chat, you can just private message me. Yeah, there we go. So scratching the couch, finding socks lying around, tipping over the laundry basket, hiding socks. Okay. And final one. There we go. <clears throat> so Abby has the goals that she wants to achieve. What sort of tactics might she use? Being cute, yes. Being cute is a tactic. It is one that gets exploited a lot, usually to avoid being in trouble for anything. Um, she can no longer crawl into places that she shouldn't actually. She's got a lot bigger since that photo was taken. But yeah, you get the idea. We are talking fairly simple, fairly instinctive stuff. You understand I won't say you understand how the cat's minds work, but if they were people, you'd have a better understanding. You understand how they might try to achieve their goals. You don't need to know a huge amount about the system at this point. You can be extremely vague, extremely high level, and still get useful threats, useful tactics, useful motivations out of it. Now, what you do when you've got that? <clears throat> so you've scrolled down your project, your system idea on a napkin. You've taken it to the board and said, I've got this idea. The mean security people have then said, well, we want your threat model. We want to see your list of threats. <clears throat> so you've done that. What do they do with it? Well, in a perfect world, before it goes any further, you take the goals of the system, because you know those. You know why you're building the system. You note down the threat motivations and the threat tactics. You look at those three things and you put down the high level functional security requirements. You put down doors must close automatically. You put down soft furnishings must be claw resistant. You put down people must be trained to walk away from the cat when she's being cute. There must be user awareness training, otherwise, no one gets anything done high level security requirements, functional security requirements, because the key thing is, because you've written them in response to these threats, in response to these tactics, they're testable. As you build the system, you can make sure that they are being built in by testing them. Security is not non-functional. Right, <clears throat> any questions about threat before we move on to impact? Okay, so impact. When you are outlining designs, what would happen if this was threatened? <clears throat> We're going one level lower in terms of abstraction than threat. 
you probably don't have a detailed design of the system. You don't necessarily have the specifics of each piece of technology, but you'll have an idea of what assets are involved. You'll have an idea of the high level components. Uh, if threat focused was an aerial city, an aerial view of say a country, <clears throat> impact focused might look at the individual cities or the individual buildings in a city. And you can work at different levels. So you can say, well, we're going to take it a step up and do the impact focused across this wider area, or you can focus down. So you don't care at that point about the real details. You don't care about the construction materials, the rooms or anything else. But broadly speaking, you want to have the zoning, you want to have the purposes built out. And what would happen if this was threatened? Well, if the kitchen was successfully attacked, then the cat eats a whole plastic bag of dreamies. And that means you go to the vet and it gets very expensive. <clears throat> and the way to deal with this one, fairly simple. You may have come across it before, attack trees. Now, attack trees can get quite large, very large, in fact. Uh, so I'm not going to do a detailed one. And the development of them is somewhat unclear. So Bruce Schneier was definitely involved at some point. Early papers also employ the NSA was involved, and I've yet to find a detailed history of how they came about, how they were developed. They are probably also older than that. Uh, now, attack trees can be seen as an impact-oriented approach. They can be seen as a goal-oriented approach. They can be seen as an asset-oriented approach. But you're ultimately beginning with the thing that happens if the threat is successful. You don't have to have an attacker with motivation. You could just start with an impact and do an attack tree. You don't have to do the threat focus first. It's just very useful to do so because it helps you focus. Now, attack trees. This is, again, a very simple one. The attacker, whoever they are, wants to access the 11 herbs and spices recipe. So this is why it could be asset focused or goal focused or impact focused, but ultimately that's what they want to do. How could they do that? Well, they could break into the vault because we're keeping it in a cheap vault and they could become a trusted executive or they could reverse engineer it. Great. How do you, you break into the vault? Well, you have to assemble a heist crew, kind of important. You have to go full Ocean's Eleven. Uh, how do you become a trusted executive? We've, we've got two options there. And, you know, one of them's easier than the other. You could say, I'm going to fake a CV and get some fake references. Alternatively, you could say, I'm going to spend 15 years building up the relevant industry experience in order to become a trusted executive for this company so that I can have the 11 herbs and spices recipe is an attack vector. Reverse engineering the recipe, they have to get a sample. There's no way to do it. If they can't get a sample, they have to get a sample. <clears throat> right. So moving on. Exercise. We, we need a goal for this one. So does anyone want to be brave and come up with a goal that our attacker is after? Anyone at all? I think everyone's gone to sleep.
doesn't have to be creative. It can be an obvious one. I'm just going to give you one then. So for steel, for gold. Okay. Steal the gold from the bank. <clears throat> How might they try to do that? Well, tunnel under with a digging machine. Rob the bank at gunpoint. Mad science. So how do they tunnel under? Well, it requires city plans and a ticking machine. Robbing it at gunpoint, get a gun into the bank. Mad science, <clears throat> let's go with rotation or shrink ray. Those are both assets, both things that would allow them to use mad science to rob the bank. It is that easy. I mean, normally you have slightly more realistic attack vectors, slightly more realistic opportunities, but it really is that easy. And you stop drawing your attack tree when it's about right to stop, between an hour or two, two hours at the absolute maximum. So, what use is in attack tree? How can we make use of it? Well, we can take it. And here's our 11 herbs and spices one again. What can we do about that? We can prevent them from breaking into the vault. We can say, actually, we're not going to keep it in a vault. We are going to keep it securely on an encrypted hard drive with all sorts of security around it, stick it in one of Amazon's vaults and say, you can't actually realistically even discover where it is, let alone break in there. At that point, doesn't matter if they assemble a heist crew. Now, becoming a trusted executive, okay, uh, we'll do background checks. We will prevent fake CVs. Now, how do we prevent them coming in if they've gained 15 years of industry experience and would actually be a perfect candidate? we don't at that point we don't really care it's an attack vector that's dealing with itself reverse engineering the recipe we make it complicated to get a sample we mix it in two different factories half of it in each we only combine it at certain sites we put armed guards on the shipments to the shops whatever you want to do but you make it difficult to get a sample can't make it impossible, but you can certainly mitigate the possibility. Okay, <clears throat> vulnerability focus now. Now, vulnerability focused seems to be one of the most popular, and I suspect it's because it's one of the easiest to conceptualize. So, vulnerability focused. <clears throat> Stride is a kind of old method now, still used, no longer used by Microsoft who developed it. Uh, most widely known, I confidently say. As with many other vulnerability focused methods, you need to have a diagram. You need to understand the flows of the system. You need to understand the components. You need to understand the interaction. While it's not used by Microsoft anymore, and it does definitely have flaws, it is by no means a perfect system. It's still useful because you can use it, you can apply it, it is easy to understand, it is straightforward to apply. It may be flawed, but it's definitely not useless. One of the main reasons people think it's flawed is because a lot of the categories overlap. So spoofing and tampering, well, which is a man in the middle attack? Well, it could also be information disclosure. You could say it's elevation of privilege, all sorts of things you could argue. And if you're using stride, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to let the argument about which category a vulnerability falls into happen. Once the vulnerability is down, the category does not matter except for one specific purpose that we will get to. But the category just doesn't matter anymore. 
So once it's written down for one category, you can just say, we've got it, let's move on. So stride, some people weren't happy with it. So we also had striped. Uh, striped is mainly included here so that I can show that people happily take and adapt threat modeling methods. And they really, really do. So striped, of course, is a completely original methodology. Uh, definitely not just stride with privacy added. Threat modeling methodologies are not sacred dogma. They can be changed. They should be changed to be usable. Linden, Linden is privacy focused. So while stride and stripe, they will tend to focus on data flow diagrams. Linden is interesting in that you can actually apply it directly to a data model. It is privacy focused. It's about re-identification attacks. It's very useful for those. It's worth a look, particularly if you're doing privacy by design. Uh, the OWASP top 10 is not a threat model. Or well, sorry, not a threat modeling method. You can use it as a threat model, but frankly, it's a bit generic for that. You can trim it down and do all sorts of things with it. What it's really useful as is just a list of potential attacks. So that's going to the NVD approach. If we look at the national vulnerability database, we compare everything in it to our system. Well, no, let's not do that. OWASP top 10, you've knocked out most of them just by picking the most common. Now, I actually like to reduce it a bit more and make it more generic because, for example, various injection floors show up four times in it. And I don't see the point in repeating them over and over as separate categories, but that's a separate session. Uh, then there's the gamified variants. So you saw the adversary cards. There's also security cards. There's Linden Go, which is a variant of Linden, which is obviously gamified. Uh, Elevation of Privilege is a game variant of Stride. And OWASP Cornucopia is a variant of various OWASP vulnerabilities. We're going to skip the exercise for Stride because it's always quite a painful one but I do want to run through this bit. <clears throat> so stride has possibly one of the most useful techniques I have come across in threat modeling, which is this idea of zones or lines of trust. Uh, data flow diagrams work for this. Any sort of system diagram will work for this, but data flow diagrams are what it was designed for. And you define your trust zone as and when you need to. There are other methods available, but I like trust zones. That means that I could draw a trust zone around the whole company. I could draw it around a specific system. If I was in automotive, I could draw a trust zone around an individual sensor or even an individual chip helping to power that individual sensor. You choose where the trust zone goes and it goes where it is useful. So long as there is data flowing across it, as long as there is information exchange in some form over that trust zone, you can examine those data flows, those information flows for potential vulnerabilities. If you go too detailed, you will waste time. If you go too high level, you will waste time. Placing them is more art than science, but you place them where it is useful to work. And if you find you've gone too detailed, great, you take a step back. If you find you've gone too wide, you just focus in a bit more. So how to use the output? Well, if it's stride, this is that one case where I said the categories are useful. If you're doing some sort of categorization, some sort of library or list method of vulnerability focus, you can often say that these categories are dealt with by applying these security controls. Spoofing is often dealt with by applying some sort of authentication control. Tampering is often dealt with with some sort of integrity check. Repudiation, auditing, information disclosure, you increase confidentiality, denial of service, you increase availability, and elevation of privilege, well, you bring in authorization. 
that is the only way in which the categories are useful beyond brainstorming the attacks in the first place. So that is the only reason to use them. It's not worth arguing over. It's not worth two hours of debate about whether something fits into information disclosure or tampering, because then you've just wasted your two hour threat modeling session. How do you prioritize these? You now have, just from your design, I want to point out, you have not built anything yet. You have not committed to anything. So you can fix these things during that design phase. You can say, when we build it, we will build it so that this does not apply. So <clears throat> how do you then prioritize them? Because you might not be able to fix everything on the list. I'm going to run through three examples of how you can do it. We have Dread, which was developed to work with Stride. And Dread has five categories. You can probably guess why it's no longer used, but it's got damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, discoverability. How easy is it to discover? How many people will it affect? How easy is it to exploit? How easy is it to reproduce? Don't ask me what the difference is between reproducibility and discoverability, and how much damage will it do? You stick a score in each one, one to five, one to 10, take your pick and you take the average and you say the highest score is the highest priority to fix the lowest score is the lowest priority to fix you can drop categories from this you can add new ones you can do whatever you want but it really is that simple uh, cvss <clears throat> as might be clear from this i am not a fan of cvss certainly for prioritizing in threat modeling I have seen people trying to do it. I have yet to see it work well. It is not suitable for something like threat modeling where you need to move quickly and you don't have detail because you're still in design. <clears throat> so just don't is my answer on that one. Uh, one I do particularly like, if you've got the resources to do it, pick five people who should know what they're talking about in that area. Tell them to give it a score out of five, score out of 10, take the average. That simple, that fast, that quick. There's a little statistical trick, which means that you're likely to be right over 90% of the time, or at least within a reasonable range. That's it, that simple. <clears throat> Whew. So next bit is how all of this plugs together in some sort of useful way when we're talking about design and development pipelines. Well, project stages. We have the conception of a project. I came up with the idea and I wrote it down on my napkin. And I do threat focused threat modeling to come up with a list of threats that might target that project and try to in some way interfere with the goals. That is a useful list of threats that I keep and can carry forwards with me. Project initiation. We're thinking about it a bit more. We've committed some resources. We've maybe sketched out an idea. Yes, on that one, Claudius. Uh, <clears throat> initiation, we can start doing impact focus. We know the assets that were involved not at a detailed level, but we know the assets that will start to be involved, the type of things we're working with. So we can focus on what the impacts would be of those assets being compromised. Are we dealing with personal data? Great. What is the impact of that being compromised? What's the target? What's the goal? What's the asset there? Let's sketch out a quick attack tree. We'll use our threats from the threat focused exercise we did earlier. Uh, planning, we're going more into detail now. So we've got our architectural diagrams, we've got our system diagrams, and we go into the vulnerability focused. And we do that around the results of the impact focus. If we've got time, we can widen it, but we start with those ones that came out of impact focus and the ones that came out of impact focus came out of threat focused. Execution of the project. Well, here we stop threat modeling 
And during the build, we are remediating things as we go. That is, we are making sure that we build correctly so that the vulnerabilities we've picked up, the vulnerabilities we've theorized about, never make it into the finished product. Finally, we then have monitoring. This is, in a way, the most depressing part, because if you have done everything perfectly and everyone has done everything perfectly, you find absolutely nothing and nothing at all goes wrong. You only find out when you haven't done something wrong. And that's where you say this vulnerability appeared. We weren't expecting it. Pen test picked it up. Let's go back and look at our threat modeling and see why we mix, missed it. So when threat modeling is perfect, it's really boring and really quite hard to validate because no one tracks what doesn't happen. Okay. Let's see. So, <clears throat> skip the pub quiz. These are the resources that I've worked with largely in making this, uh, along with some of my own. Hopefully, it's been useful. Hopefully, you haven't actually all gone to sleep. Are there any questions? Did you want to discuss anything? Did you want to ask about any particular method? Did you want to disagree with me over whether a threat is outside of the, your control or our control or not? Anything like that? Hi, uh, James. Thanks for the session. I enjoyed it tremendously. One quick question. Um, the methods you described, you covered the threat. And the vulnerability, do you have any um, things which cover the impact as well? So with impact, I would generally look at the attack trees because you're, you're looking at the impact of what happens if the threat comes in. You can work at a slightly higher level than vulnerability. You don't need the full design, but it sits somewhere in the middle. Um, strangely, it's, it's the one that seems to have been covered least. I've not found any other method that picks up on impact or the asset or the goal as the thing to focus on beyond attack trees. So there might be one out there, but I've not found it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, if nobody else asks questions. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Do you have a source where you can get the, the um, adversary um, uh, trading card? So I found the set two, but that suggests there's a set one as well. Please tell if I froze. Sorry, James, Claude. I don't think any of us heard you then. I think you froze That's for a little fine. bit. That's fine. I wasn't sure who had frozen. So, Claudia, so I missed your question, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? It was good, yes. great timing. <laughs> exactly when you ask, you freeze. Um, um, you, you showed the, the adversary trading cards. And I found a deck or a set two. Is there also a set one or where do you get the trading cards from? There is a set one. Um, if you, I will put the slide back up. So I think Mark talks about them quite a bit or if you just drop him a message, he's usually more than happy to share them. Okay, cool. Um, right, so Matt, 
okay so the scaling this process now i've done this wrong plenty of times i've got it right a few times and the way that i have found works most commonly is by taking it away from security and selling it to people as something that lets them take charge of their own security posture and the security team is simply a resource for them to call on now if you've not got a security team any security expertise in the company you've got bigger problems but if you've got any sort of resource which can provide that security expertise teams often have a surprisingly good idea of how their systems work once you get them thinking about the threat about someone wanting to attack they tend to adapt quite well and then all that your security person there your security resource is doing is steering them away from the utterly unrealistic attacks and helping guide them towards the realistic ones and you use that to get them that expertise and that experience but the important thing is really they need to be in charge of the process and they need to have it sold to them as a way that they then own their security that it's not security coming in and saying you must do this it is them going we think this is the type of security posture we need we think these are the sorts of controls we need so we're going to build these and unless they ring alarm bells you just go with it so i found ownership works best there and then providing a security resource just to keep things on track but once people do it once they start threat modeling and get into the habit of it it's surprising how quickly they pick security out of things hopefully that answers the question yeah uh, thanks a lot i really appreciate that um i have a, I have a quick follow-up um so um, this is coming from the perspective of being a limited security resource. So I was asking that question. So like, how, how could I get that other teams doing this kind of process without like, you know, me being involved in every single exercise? Um, if you could, um, if you're trying to roll out a process or, you know, get this kind of um, thinking um, out to the rest of the organization. We kind of have some like arc review documents and stuff that we go through as an organization when we're rolling out new services and stuff. Um, do you, what would be like a few good questions to include in that if you could like, before we jumped into being like, every service needs to go through this threat modeling process. Like we could do like baby steps towards it. And like we could get three to five questions that we might be able to put in the security review process or as a section of a architecture review. What do you think would be like the key questions to ask, I guess, as like a segue into before you roll out this whole process, yeah. just thinking like this is easily to an easy step to begin this process. So you can. You can reduce threat modeling to about four questions. And you start with who or what wants something to go wrong or will cause something to go wrong, who or what is the threat. You then go, what could go wrong and how bad is it? What can we do about it? And did we do a good enough job? And if you just leave it at those four questions, that is a start threat modeling. And what you'll find is the, what could go wrong will get people to say, okay, this actually has quite a big impact. Maybe we should look at it more or maybe it doesn't maybe it's a tiny project no one really cares about beyond it would be a nice thing maybe it's about painting the wall a nicer shade of puce still a project but what could go wrong well the wrong shade could turn up do we care not really but yeah so threat modeling you can boil it down to those four questions and if you can get people to ask those four questions and then say if you think the thing that could go wrong is bad enough to warrant it then let's go through a more detailed process if it's not we can gloss over it and it drives security people including me absolutely nuts because it's giving far too much control to people who aren't appropriately professionally paranoid but it means they work with us and it improves 
So there's a trade-off there. Sure. Thank you. I, I imagine this could be a good, like, you know, at least a good way to start a conversation that might not have happened had this question not even been proposed in the first place. Yeah. Um, Threat modeling is brilliant when you do it. It doesn't matter how well you do it or how thoroughly you do it. If you do it, you will get benefit out of it because at the very worst, it gets people thinking about security. At the best, it prevents some vulnerabilities. So Thank it's you. more important to get them to try something than to get it right first time. Thanks, I appreciate that. Right. Well, I'm not going to just stand here in silence. So, uh, do you want to stop the recording? Let people go? Yeah, that's fine. Stop your recording. Yeah. If there are other questions, I'm happy to stick around.